Hello and welcome. I'm Natasha from Telltale Hearts and this is our storytelling module two, bringing stories to life at home. And this is our fourth session, helping you to create stories at home with your children. So firstly, now that I've welcomed you all, let me just also say thank you very much to the Abu Dhabi Early Childhood Authority for making this initiative a reality. And so we follow on from last week when we had the Dragon of Krakow and I hope that you enjoyed that story and that you had fun finding other mythical characters, maybe a story with a mythical character and did you experiment with those visual aids in helping to bring the story to life? I hope you did. And if you've got any comments or any questions, you can put them in the chat box and I'll make sure to pick them up um, at the end of this webinar. So today we're gonna to be looking at how you can create a story from scratch with your child, with your children. Um, we're gonna look at focus on story sources, where story ideas come from and what make good sources for those stories. And then we'll move on to a more structured method of developing narrative, starting with character, creating a setting or a world, that world building, and then solving a dilemma. So I've kind of broken this a little bit into two parts so that the earlier part we're going to be focusing on the younger children and then later as we look at creating a story in more structured ways we'll focus on some of the older children and ways of being able to support and help them. So just to explain a little bit about myself for those that aren't yet familiar with me. Um, I am the artistic director of a theatre company, Telltale Hearts, and I trained in storytelling and have been doing it for many years. Um, I also trained in Eastern theatre styles as well as Western theatre, and I thoroughly enjoy mi mixing the two things and also bringing stories to life from different cultures and, and, and different countries. So, um, I also work as a writer, so as well as writing for theatre, I've also been commissioned to write um, picture books. One was for um, the NHS Trust, uh, looking at accidents in the home and how to help parents to avoid some of those early accidents. And I worked with an illustrator on um, creating stories to help with safety at the home. Um, and I've also written a middle grade book that was researched using children's ideas and I worked for a whole academic year with a class of children in which we did different interventions, some of which I'll be sharing with you as part of this webinar, just to get their ideas and help uh, drive some of the narrative and drive some of the dilemmas that took place in this story. So, um, I love stories and I love um, unpicking them, what makes good stories. So I hope that I'm gonna be able to help you in helping your children to also find ways of inventing and creating stories. So <clears throat> where do stories, where do you get the ideas for a story? That's one of the things that I so often get asked. And for a start, quite often they are from pre-existing stories so a bit like the stories you will have seen in the earlier sessions as part of these, this module. Um, some of those stories are folk tales from different parts, some are myths, some are legends, others are fairy tales, and they're a fantastic source for characters and stories. Um, and they can often be used as a template where you might start with something that your child knows, but then maybe it can go off in a different direction. So that's a really good place to start is already with existing myths, existing folk tales or legends or fairy tales. Second of all, are picture prompts. I love picture prompts. So here's an example of one that I used when I was doing the Guardians of Utopia. So this is the Simor, Simurg bird. And um, I use this as a picture prompt for the children to explore ideas as to 
what this character was, what did they, where did they come from? A lot of them thought that came from the moon because there was the moon in the background. Others felt that it came from outer space. Some thought it came from the stars. Others thought that that was like an egg and it was like the protector of a great precious golden egg. So there can be all sorts that you can glean from a picture prompt. So that's one example of a picture prompt. You can also have something that's rather more abstract and ask what your child sees in that picture. What, what kind of place, maybe this is a setting or maybe this is a character. Abstract images are fantastic ways of opening up imaginative possibilities for your children to think of what that might be. And they will always have an answer for you perhaps more readily than as adults have. So that's another, that's another version of a picture prompt. Um, or you can use books for picture prompts. I, this is one of my favorite books, which is an illustration of the thousand, night, uh, uh, <clears throat> the thousand Nights, which I'm sure you're more familiar with. Um, and here's a fantastic, picture prompt that even if they don't know where that story is coming from, an image to start with, hmm, what's going on here? So that's a really good place to start. And if you have um, a very busy book, a book that's full of lots of images, um, what you can also do is you can make a little window so you can isolate part of the story. So here, I've just made a little window like a frame that focuses on just one small thing that's taking place there with the camel and the gentleman underneath who's getting ripped. So that could make another good starting point, but you could use your, your frame as a way of getting your child to choose what part of a picture it is that they want to look at and choose for their story. So picture prompts are a fantastic way of getting a source of ideas for stories. Another good way of introducing a story or getting a story brewing is to introduce a clue and give it to your child. What's this? I don't know where it's come from, but there's something inside. Shall we have a look? Aha, uh -huh. there's a scroll. I wonder who this has come from, or I wonder why they put it in a bottle. I don't know, maybe your child knows. Oh, and there's something written on here, which you won't be able to read unless you can read backwards, but it's help me. So there's somebody who's definitely in trouble. So starting with a clue is a really great way of sowing the seed of a story. But if you don't have a fantastic bottle or a scroll, or you might have something else that you could use as a clue. So you might have part of an item of clothing that's been found. Who does this belong to? Could it belong to a wizard or a magical kind of creature? Or could it belong to a princess maybe? Or maybe a royal character? I don't know. So maybe finding an item of clothing or costume and trying to think what kind of character or who might that belong to or how did it get lost is another good starting point for a story. And finally, but by no means least, is to start with an object. And for me, it's really important that the objects are also presented in a little bit of an exciting way because you want to get your child interested in creating this story for you or with you. So presentation really helps, I think, rather than just picking something up and handing it to them, is maybe putting them in a box. Do you have a box that you could fill with a scarf and you could put maybe 
three or four objects inside. I've, I've put a few more. So I've got um, one of my favorites here, this little character. So he's a great starting point for stories in terms of where does he live and ooh, what's his work? What's his job? What does he do? So there's li this little character here could be, or something much smaller here is a heart shaped stone or a heart made of stone. And what kind, what, what story might involve a stone heart? Maybe your child knows who this stone heart belongs to. Or it could be a beautiful shell that was found at the bottom of the sea. And maybe this shell is magical. I don't know what magic property it has. Do you know? Or could it be a story about a camel? A camel that's lost its owner or a camel that has run away? I don't know. Or maybe it's a story about a broken dancer or an injured dancer, or it could be a doll. What's happened to her? How did she get broken? I don't know. When you are presenting a box of objects, if maybe three or four objects, let your child explore them, let them choose. That's the important thing, is that you're not handing them one object and asking them to make a story out of that. Let them choose which object it is that sort of speaks to them or inspires them to start a story. And then maybe next time or another week, you could put two or three other objects, maybe one of the ones that they didn't choose last time and put them in the box and see, you could, this could become the story box. What story are you going to tell next time? So you're inventing these stories and your child's inventing these stories. Well, how can you record them? I mean, can you film them making the story up? That's one way. What I thought I'd share with you is an excellent way that I came across, which is um, an early years educator called Vivian Gusson Paley, who worked in the US. And she came up with a whole way of developing stories with young children and also then helping the children to dramatize those stories. And she wrote a book called The Boy Who Would Be a Helicopter. And the idea that, that Vivian Gusson Paley developed has been taken off by early years dramatists all over the world, really. Um, and they've developed those ideas to, to write stories that children tell. And the way it works is very simple. Um, it starts with a sheet of paper. So A5 sheet, not too big and not too small because the story is going to fill the paper. At least it can't go beyond the bottom of the paper. If it only goes halfway, that's fine, that's enough. But the story can't go beyond the bottom of the paper. So if you're writing and it starts to get close to the end, you need to give them a little warning that we're getting close to the end of the page. So you're going to have to finish that story. And the way it works is that the child might be three, might be four, could even be as young as two, maybe five, who hasn't yet got the writing skills to be able to write their own story, at least not necessarily intelligibly. You are going to work as the scribe for their story. So you write verbatim, word for word, exactly what your child says for that story. Every, every little nuance that they pick up, you write it down and record it. Even if there's a few sort of nonsense sounds that that's the kind of sound that the beast makes. Rrr. See if you can find a way of writing rrr on that paper. And if you're unsure about something that they've said, maybe you're not quite sure um, who's saying that, then you can always ask them to clarify as you're writing it down. The important thing about this is to give the status to your children's ideas as young as they are, make them the expert in their story. And what's, <laughs> you might not get the most 
brilliant story in terms of what a storyteller might tell you is the most perfect story, but this is not about getting it right from the beginning. And who's sometimes the strangest, most absurd stories are often the really quite revealing and profound. So this isn't about getting them to get it right. It's about exercising their story thinking, their story writing, even though they're not literally doing the scribing, you're doing the scribing, but they're learning the art of being able to, to think to write. And that's the important process. When we're writing anyway, really what we're doing is recording thought and they are still able to do that thought. They just need you to record it for them. And of course, the brilliant thing is that once you've written it down, you can read it back to them afterwards. And that's a reaffirmation. They can see their story, it's been written, it's there. It can be read and it can be read again. It, it can be repeated and it could also be acted out. So just to give you a little bit of an idea as to what I'm talking about, let's see it in action. So unfortunately, I don't have a demonstration of me doing it with children, but what we do have is um, a practitioner that's using Vivian Gusson Paley's method, and she's doing it in a nursery with a few different children where you'll see her recording verbatim what they are saying and writing it down. So there's quite a lot of background noise because it is in a nursery, but this is easily something that you can do at home. So I will stop talking and let you watch. It's just two minutes and let's see how it works. Thank you. If you could play video one for us. <laughs> One day there was one girl. One day there was one girl. She was in her classroom. She went outside and she made some sandcastle. Well, the old girl was this cake. Cake was a cake and a cat. It was cat was just a cat. There was once upon a time there was Barry the fish fish fingers. Yeah? Okay, let me write that down. Once upon a time there was Barry the fish fish fingers. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that little extract and you can see how wonderful some of those characters are that the children come up with of Barry the fish, fish finger. And the description of the puffer fish there at the end is fantastic. And I love that the shoe itself decides to go for a swim making the shoe its own character. So I thought I'd share with you, I did this exercise with my daughter when she was four and I did it at home. Um, and I'm just gonna read for you the story that she came up with, which was a complete kind of demonstration, exactly as you've seen it on the video. And I'll just unpick it afterwards a little bit so you can see a little bit of, of what's going on. Um, okay, so I've, this is my daughter Astrid and she called it the giant story. Once upon a time there was a giant and he didn't like the warmth and he crept inside and he felt all the cold that was outside. He went and sneaked inside and it was Hot, hot, hot. He came and he said to the people, fee, fi, fo, fum. 
I can smell the blood of an English girl. He went outside and he felt all the cold wind. He pushed himself into his blanket at home. The end. So that was my daughter's story. And you can hear in the story that she has a sequencing problem because uh, initially the giant creeps inside, but he feels the cold that was outside. Is that because the giant is feeling the cold in him from having been outside? But then she says he went and sneaked inside again. So I can see from this how she is working out how to navigate the timeline of a story when a character has gone into something that they're then inside. So there's a huge amount of learning that's taking place in terms of that sequencing. And this is the, fir this is the very first example that I've got here. So later, as we did it more regularly, her sequencing improved. She understood how to set that, that timeline and how to, um, how to um, once you've got the character inside somewhere, to not throw them back outside again and get them to re-enter again. Um, and she was also kind of processing her own sort of experiences. We had seen um, uh, a Jack and the Beanstalk show. So I think the giant had, had really, um, well, filled her imagination and she kind of wanted to explore that experience by owning that giant and finding out a little bit more about him by making up a story about him. She has got an innate sense of drama and suspense. It's there in the story about when he sneaked inside and how it felt hotter and hotter. Yeah, there's a, there's a climactic build up there. So there's that innate sense of um, suspense and anticipation. And it's wonderful to learn that about your children as they tell you the story, how much they can show you. Um, and also she explored, as I said, how the giant felt. So it's kind of exploring this um, terrible character that was in this original Jack and the Beanstalk story and actually wanting to explore how the giant felt in going home to its bed. So there's an awful lot of empathy going on and, and trying to un understand why I might do something so terrible as eat, um, smell the blood of an English girl. Hmm. So there's so much learning that this shows me. And um, so what I have subsequently done is use that idea of starting with an object or with a clue, or it might even be starting with um, with a word. So like I had um, a little message written on here of help me, might be that you just want to start with, um, with a word. This might be a little bit tricky for early years. Protection, I'm sorry, it's backwards, but <laughs> protection. But the idea of protection, that snuggly blanket's a little bit like um, a, a protection theme. So if you want to start this exercise with a prompt, it could be one of those picture prompts, or it could be um, like a, a clue, or it could be an object from the story box, which might be the easiest one, and get them to start telling you a story from that story box. But remember, it can't go beyond the bottom of that page. And when it's finished, read it back to check with them that you have recorded it accurately. Um, and then why not act it out afterwards? You can read the story aloud and you can get them to act out the giant creeping inside and you could do the wind. All of those things to help dramatize it and get them to act out that story too. So let's have a little look at um, how you can create stories for those that are a little bit older. Um, 
So like I said, with younger years, it's more about developing that story muscle and getting them to do it repeatedly as, a, as an exercise and um, different stories about different about different things or different objects with older children. So say five to six years to eight, um, you can really start to explore who those characters are, those starting points in more detail. So if you're starting with a character and it might be that you also want to use an actual character or you might want to ask them to imagine a character. It could be a mythical beast like um, the dragon from Krakow or it could be um, uh, it, it could be the Simorgberg or the Rockbird. <clears throat> So once you've asked them to think of a character, um, oh, actually, sorry, could also could also be an object. So like I said, it could be, who does the stone heart belong to? So if you haven't got a little mini character, if you haven't, if you've got an object instead, it's who does this belong to? What character might own a stone heart? What character might have a stone heart? side so and then it's finding out a little bit about their character and because they're inventing because they're thinking it's helpful again if you can scribe down what it is they're saying so as they as they are answering your questions what do they look like write the description down just like we had the sheep for the younger years, but this time you're writing a description of that character down. What does the character sound like? And then you can start to interrogate, what do they wear? Hmm? Are they wearing, you know, are they wearing normal clothes or do they have a special outfit? Maybe they've got something with a brand on it. I don't know. Or maybe a slogan that says something. Hmm? Um, do they have a super skill or a super power? And write that down. Um, what's their favourite food? Or what food do they absolutely hate? Um, what are they scared of? Is there something that this character is scared of? What could it be? You can ask them. Hmm. And how do they travel? How do they move? Do they walk? Or have they got 16 legs? Or do they fly? Or do they travel on a skateboard? <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know how this character travels, but I, they will know. Um, and what you're trying to do as well is that you're trying to get them to move away from a character that they might know from the television or from a video game. You want them to invent something new, which is why using your own either object or using your own picture prompt is a good way of helping them to escape what is that world of gaming and that world of, of television and to get them to think imaginatively away from that. Um, and so what does this character do first thing in the morning when they wake up? What's the first thing this character does? And your child's gonna tell you and you're gonna write that. Once you've made your notes, you're going to go back through all of those notes and you're going to put it into a character description. So <clears throat> if it's um, so the troll and find out what uh, our our troll and his name is Rocky. So Rocky likes to wear dungarees and his favourite food are wood lice. And what he hates more than anything else are pancakes. He cannot bear pancakes. Um, and um, he travels underground. He doesn't travel overground, only ever underground. Um, and his super skill is that he's incredibly strong and he can break rocks with his hands. He's so strong, uh, but he's really, really scared of butterflies. I don't know why, but he's very scared of butterflies. Um, and in first thing in the morning, he's extremely grumpy. So you would read out your character description and then you 
why not? Can you show me what your character is like first thing in the morning? So if I'm doing the rock crawl. Pancakes? I hate pancakes. I want something else for breakfast. So you can get your child to maybe act out their character as they wake up or do a frozen expression of how they are first thing in the morning, just to get them a little bit into what this character is and how this character might be. Um, and there's no reason why you can't join in as well and be the character too and find out how they move and how they, how they, you know, are they, uh, are they sprightly or are they heavy? And just find, it just helps get a little bit inside the character's head if you can wake up as that character. So now that you've explored a little bit the character and through those questions, and you can always make up your own questions as well. There's no reason to just limit yourself to the questions I've, I've put in there. There might be other questions that you'd want to add. Um, it's where does this character live? Where is this story going to be set? Hmm. So here are a few questions that you could ask to get the ideas going of where the setting or your, of your character might be. So where do they live? <clears throat> well, I know that Rocky here lives underground. But does he have a particular underground chamber? Does he have actually a little home, a little chamber with his own little rock bed that he sleeps on? Hmm? And, and what does the sky look like in their world? Well, in, in Rocky's world, it's, it's probably gonna be quite earthy or depending on whereabouts he is, it might be quite sandy above. Um, certainly some rock and tree roots may be coming through, um, but, where your character is set might be up on the clouds and the sky might be full of rainbows or it might be full of stars, I don't know. Um, that's for your child to decide. And can you describe the surroundings, the immediate surroundings of this character? What could they be? Is it rocks or what kind, of, is it watery world that they're in? Is it an island? And where in this land that they live in is their favourite place of all? So um, Rocky's favourite place, definitely eating. Mm. Yeah. So his favourite place is sitting on a small boulder with his bowl and eating because that's his favourite thing. But I don't know what your child's character's favourite thing might be or favourite place might be. And what's the weather? What's the temperature like? Is it hot, like in Astrid's story? Or is it cold? Is it damp? Is it, is it um, like I said, is it, is it wet? What's that kind of temperature? Is it icy? I don't know. These are just to get their ideas going because they'll know what the answers to it are. And if they are having trouble, then you can use a picture prompt as a place, maybe a picture prompt from, from a book um, that might help with, with place in terms of a setting, but that's entirely, that's entirely up to you. It's just if they're struggling to invent a place, then a picture prompt can be another really good way of getting them to think around that scenery. Or also, if they are being the character and they're waking up, ask them what the first thing they see is, because that's going to be in their world. And that's a really good starting point for building that world and that setting of what kind of place they inhabit for your story. So once again, once you've got them to describe that setting is to read it back to them, read back what that place is and what their favorite place within that world is. And you're really starting to interrogate some of their ideas here. And now we're gonna think about, oh, what's the dilemma? So for any story, there has to be a problem. There has to be a problem to solve. And 
really usually what that problem is relates to that main character. So what is it that the main character wants? That's the most important thing to establish when you're moving into the dilemma. So once you put your world building aside, it's time to think about what that dilemma is. What does that main character want? So what does Rocky want more than anything else in the world? Does Rocky want treasure? Does Rocky want love? Does Rocky want a friend? Does he just want to find his favorite, favorite woodlouse to eat? I don't know. So what does your character want? And the problem is going to be what stops them from pretty much getting it. So if Rocky wanted treasure, then it's the creature that's going to guard that treasure, whether it be a Simorg bird or whether it be a dragon or whatever it is that is guarding that treasure is going to be the obstacle that Rocky's going to have to overcome to get it. If it's, one, if it's trying to find a friend, it's the fact that Rocky is himself an absolute grump. And that's, that's not a good way of making friends. So how is he go going to overcome that, that problem is the absolute sort of bulk of your story. And then you want to add peril, which is basically building it up to a bit of a cliffhanger moment that dun, dun, dun. So Rocky wants treasure, but it's guarded by the Simorg. <sighs> and the Simorg has captured Rocky and imprisoned Rocky with in a snake pit. So how is Rocky going to get out of the snake pit and get the treasure? Dun, dun, dun. We don't know. But how he's going to overcome it is how he's going to triumph. And that's going to be where the end of the story comes in. So in terms of creating your story, once you've got your character, once you've got your setting, is those are your givens for the story is to find out what your character wants, what the problem is to them getting it, add to that peril to make it into that cliffhanger, and then how they overcome that problem or that dilemma, and that gives you your end. And depending on the age of your child or how, um, or how exceptional they are in making up stories, you could create two characters. There's no reason why your child can't create one character just as the way we've done it. And then there's no reason why you can't swap over and they ask you questions about your character. So you come up with the second character in the story and then it can be a problem that comes that happens when the two characters meet. That's already starting to make the story a little more complex, but that depends upon the developmental level, the age level that your child is working at. So just to give you an example, if we were to explore the dragon of Krakow through this story breakdown into its parts, you've got the story that starts in terms of the setting where you've got the forbidden cave, which is across the river from the village. And it's three friends that start off the whole dilemma because they want to explore the Forbidden Cave and go where they're not allowed to go. And so traveling across the river, that's what sets the whole thing off by them entering that cave and disturbing the dragon, okay? So the three friends want to explore. And because they explore, they create the problem of the dragon. So the dragon flies out of the cave and then we add peril to it because the dragon eats all the sheep belonging to the villagers. So the villagers have no more sheep to eat. So that's the escalation of the dilemma. And then we have how to solve the problem. <clears throat> and that's where Klakos, the hero of the story, comes in with the idea to poison the dragon using the fiery paste um, and to make the dragon basically die through, through exploding, through drinking too much water to put out his own fire in his belly. So that's an example of how the dragon of Krakow is broken down into those stages. 
And like I said, these are ideas for how you build the story up. So depending on how inventive they are with those characters from the beginning, you could start to work in what is what does that character want right at the beginning as you're working on that um, on that character description. OK. Um, you've got all the elements for your story then. So you can ask your child to tell you that story. And as they tell you that story, you can write it down similarly to the early years, or you can ask, you, you've gone through all the talking, so you could, you could ask your child or children to write their version of the story down for you so that you can have them read it out to you. So depending on your, on your child's writing skills is whether they write it or whether you write it down. But once it's written down, there it is, archived, recorded. They can use it as a way of being to act, to act out that story. They're the characters that they've invented and they might want to take that character on another journey or have another problem the following week. They might want to sit with that character for longer if they really, <clears throat> if they really enjoy that character. And that's absolutely fine. They can stay with that character and invent different problems for them to, to overcome in like different series of them. So <clears throat> if it helps them to, um, to tell the story, you can also give them a visual aid so that they, like we used last week, so that they can use that to help tell the story of, um, of their main character. But the most important thing is to ensure that it does get scribed, whether that's the child writing it or whether that's you writing it for them. And it might be that you demonstrate that the first time and the next time they, they write it. So once you have these stories, what are you going to do with them? Well, you can put them in a story collection. So you can have, um, you can create like a photo album of stories. So this is just a photo album, but you might, instead of having photographs, you might want to put your story here so that you actually have a photo album full of their short stories that they've created as a way of, of keeping it. <clears throat> you might want them to write them down in a diary. So they do it as almost like um, a diary book, but each story is written as its own as its own story within within its your storybook or you might want to do story scrolls so each story is written on a scroll and is then rolled up and you can keep rolling another another and another and add to it until you've got a super super long story scroll or they might want to illustrate it. They might want to make a comic. Um, and out of that comic, then illustrate parts of the story too, which is fantastic. It doesn't have to, the story doesn't just have to be told through words. It can also be told through, through image as well. So those are just some wonderful ways of being able to archive and keep some of those stories. And also for you to look back and be able to see, um, the progress that your child's made in terms of their storytelling, just like I illustrated with my daughter Astrid, I can I have her stories that I can see how she's progressed and she's quite a phenomenal story creator now and certainly gives me more than a run for my money. Um, so those are just a few ways of being able to share stories. So if anyone has any questions for me then you can put them in the chat box and I will answer those questions. I've just seen that one has popped into the chat box so um, I know that the webinar will be posted um, and I am sure that Hara will be able to give you the link to the webinar that you missed in the morning session. So I'm just going to ask if um, Hara can send you the link to that webinar that you missed, but all webinars are recorded and then they are uploaded so that you can watch it even if you, if you missed it when it was live. 
So just whilst you're thinking of any questions that you might have for me, um, the task. So why not have a go at notating your child's story? If your child is in the younger age, if they are two to five years old, then if you do it in the simple way that I showed you with the Vivian Paley Gussie um, method, then that's a fantastic way of starting. Um, and then, like I said, why not act it out with them afterwards or get your child to act it out by you reading it and you asking them to go into the role. And secondly, if you've got older children, why not develop that story together in the way that, that I've just um, explained, where you interrogate them by building a character together, creating that setting, and then letting your child retell it or write it according to how they want to invent that story with you. So have a go and see what they come up with. I'm sure that they will surprise you and delight you. Um, I've certainly been delighted with, um, with the stories I've, I've heard. So I'll just check the chat box for any questions. Great. Yep, so that's just harder confirming that the recordings as well as the handouts are available on the website. So you'll receive the links by email within the next days. Thank you, that's from the Parenting Project team. Thank you very much, Hara. Okay, so the handout is really helpful to be able to pick exactly what I was talking about there. The main thing about your story, if you just break it down into the simplest terms, it's about who it is, what do they want, how are they going to get it, what that problem is and how they're going to get it and how you want to resolve it. And in the simplest terms, that's what all stories have at their heart. So a few questions. I haven't seen any other questions come in the chat box. So just a couple of um, questions that I know people have asked me before and you filled in some fantastic pre-webinar questions. And I saw that some of you have children that always end their story in the same way. So I thought it might be interesting if I just had a look at that. So that's quite often the case that they find a familiar way of ending a story and the familiarity of it helps them to feel comfortable in the sense of, oh, I'm not quite sure how to finish it, so we'll do what we did before. So what you can do if that's the case is you can start once you've got your object or once you've got your picture prompt, whatever is your inspiration, is ask them, how is this story going to end? So rather than starting at the beginning of the story, go to the end and ask them, how is this story going to end? Because I've heard that this one's going to end differently. Can you tell me how it's going to end? So see if you can start the story at the end and then go back to the beginning and see how are you going to get to that ending then? And another way of breaking with uh, familiarity with doing the same end is, is to introduce different characters and different world settings. So that's to stimulate their imagination. And that's by giving them some interventions, which are like those clues or the story box of objects or the picture prompts. It's getting them to think away from what might be the usual reference points they have. And that, again, should give them some other ideas. And if they do end it the same way, then why not ask them what happened next? And see how they continue the story and how they get out of that one. So those are just a few ideas if your child is always ending their story in the same way. And another question that um, I get asked is, um, my child often brings real life events or real life experiences into the story. So one moment we're talking about a character and the next moment it's clearly they're talking about themselves. That is totally normal, especially for younger children where they start to identify so much with the, with the character that they're describing, that they're inventing the story about, that it becomes them. Um, and that is perfectly normal. And I think it's one of the sweet things to re record about it. And because when you you read it back, they'll notice, they'll notice that happening. 
And also, stories are a wonderful way for them to process their experience. So it's a really positive thing, I think, that they are actually processing their, their experiences. And it's developing their empathy by identifying with the character, even if it becomes a little bit grey, sh shady area as to who is who. I think that's a real positive step. And being able to separate them out will be much easier as they get older and with more familiarisation of doing it. So, um, so see it as a bonus in a way. Um, and a last question um, that I get asked um, is, uh, you know, my child doesn't want to write. They just want to act it out. Again, that's the beauty of you scribing for them because when you have notated something and if you are able to do it verbatim, so literally the language that they're using, the phrases that they're using verbatim, it is so awe-inspiring for them to have their story read back to them with the precise words that they have used in their first language. It's, you will see what an affirmation it is to them. And the more that, the more that they associate your scribing with their ideas, the more they'll want to own that process too. So I don't think there can be any better encouragement to encourage them to write than you starting the scribing for them and modeling for them how to capture their thoughts and invention on paper and how exciting it is to then hear it read back um, exactly as they've, as they've said it. Um, so that's the best way of being able to encourage them to, to continue writing. And in the meantime, encourage them to act it out because that's wonderful. <laughs> um, and I certainly coming from a drama background and think it's fantastic. It's also many children invent and create differently. So some children find it easy to put their ideas down onto page or, or to speak them. Other children, they need to act it out to be able to invent and come up with ideas. So even as they're describing the character, they might be acting out that character already. And that's absolutely fabulous. That's as it should be, because different children learn in different ways. And that's the enrichment of humankind. Um, and if that's their preferred way of, of being able to create, don't... Um, don't, don't stop them from that intuitive kind of acting it out. I know when I invent stories, um, which occasionally I do, so I don't start with the story, I'll build the story with the audience. The only way I can do that is by starting to, to physicalize the, the story so that the, the play um, comes, um, comes through, through um, through the words, um, writing slightly different, but that comes again with development and with time. So as I say, the writing will come. And that's it for our fourth and um, final session on storytelling. Thank you all of you so much for sticking with me for the four sessions. I've thoroughly enjoyed being part of this programme and I hope that you found some things of interest. I hope some of the different tasks and the different techniques that I've shown have been helpful at home. I hope you've had fun with them. And perhaps just a final thought, because I asked you right at the beginning of the sessions, um, you know, why are stories important for children? And there is, um, there was a big PhD research project um, that was run by um, Lisa Stevenson in Leeds here in the UK and a child that had been working with her on this um, as part of this, this story making um, PhD said, I feel like my mind's escaped from captivity. That's what stories meant for her. And I think that's, that's a wonderful way, especially in a pandemic when we have been um, close to home and world life isn't as once we knew it, stories help us to travel and escape that cap captivity. So I thought I'd leave that one with you. So thank you so much. And um, it's been an absolute pleasure to share 
a few of the little things I've learned along the way in my um, story making time. And I hope that our paths cross next uh, week. I'm looking at puppetry, which is for SEN children. But if you're interested in puppets it, um, and your children are interested in puppets, I'm sure it will still be interesting. So that's next week. Um, and all the best. Thank you.